In this video, we're going to go over the basics of inductance and ideal transformers. You'll recall that any time a charged particle is moving, there's a magnetic field. A stationary charged particle has a, an electric field, but no magnetic field. The, the charged particle has to be moving in order for there to be a magnetic field associated with it. And when there is a charged particle moving, if you put your right hand thumb in the direction of, of, move, of uh, movement, your right hand fingers will show the direction of the magnetic field. We also know from our study of inductors that you can take a wire with a current flowing in it and wrap it around itself over and over again and each one of those windings will have a magnetic field that then is reinforced by the magnetic fields of each of the others and so you effectively combine and, and create this composite magnetic field that is much stronger than if you just had the wire alone. We also recall that magnetic fields have no beginning and no end. They flow in loops. We talk about the magnetic flux of the magnetic field can re being represented by these lines of flux. Now, we know from inductors that the voltage, or that, yeah, the voltage across the inductor V is equal to L times dI dt which means that if the current is changing, which means if it's not constant, if the current is changing, there will be a voltage induced across the windings of the coil. So if the current here, I've got it reference down here, I in, is changing, then there will be a voltage induced. Um, we'll go ahead and reference it like this. V in, that's equal to L di dt. If the current is changing, then this magnetic field is also changing and the magnetic field that is coupled by this coil that's placed in proximity to this other coil will similarly have a voltage induced and there will be a current and a voltage associated with that also. Devices that are designed to take this property into account are known as transformers and in this video we're going to talk only about ideal transformers but the general idea is that we have one set of windings and another set of windings and the second set of windings is in the general vicinity of the first set of windings such that the magnetic field that's induced in the first set will be coupled into the second set. A little bit of terminology. The side of the transformer, and a transformer always has two sets of windings, so the side that has the source attached to it is known as the primary is known as the primary side of the transformer or the primary windings. We're going to say that this is then a voltage V1 is the voltage across the primary windings and that a current is flowing and we'll call it I1. The second set of windings is known as the secondary windings and that's the side that has the load associated with it. And once again there will be a voltage if, if the current is changing over here there will be a voltage induced over here. We're going to reference it like that V2 and a current then it would also flow, call it I2. Now this is all true for transformers in general, but the ideal transformer assumes or makes three assumptions. First, the first assumption is that any magnetic field that is created by the primary winding will be completely coupled into the secondary winding. There are a number of ways of accomplishing that. One way is to take the secondary and simply wind it right over, right on top of the primary winding. Another way of accomplishing it, which is commonly done, is using an iron core where the primary winding is round on one side of the iron core and the secondary winding is round on the other side of the iron core. And the iron core, which is a good conductor of magnetic flux then, to a good approximation, assumes or approximately we can say then that all of the all the flux from the primary is coupled through the magnetic core to the um, secondary. The second approximation that is associated with the ideal transformer, which isn't a necessarily a particularly good approximation, but if we make that assumption it sure makes the, the calculations a lot easier. And that is that there's no losses in the process which means that the magnetic flux would flow through the iron core without any resistance or what we refer to as reluctance. And if that was the case then this would not heat up and you'd have no energy loss due to heat in the transformer. That in fact isn't the case. And in fact many of the larger transformers are 
cooled or um, submerged in oil or some other type of material to facilitate heat transfer to keep the transformer from overheating. Nonetheless, we're going to assume that there are no losses in the process such that Pn equals P out. Now Pn is just I1 times V1. So this is saying that the product I1 V1 is going to equal the product of I2 times V2. And the final assumption is that the cores of each coil are made out of the same material. And if they're on an iron core, a common iron core like this, then that will definitely be the case. We then move to the circuit symbols and, and a circuit involving an ideal transformer. The symbol for an ideal transformer shows two windings next to each other with a double bar in the middle suggesting that they are coupled, perfectly coupled to each other. And sometimes they, they will show a dot and sometimes they won't. The dot is important if you're concerned about the polarity of your current and voltage relationships between the primary and the secondary. We're not going to be concerned about that. So given that we have an ideal transformer, it is true then that the ratio V2 over V1 is equal to the turns ratio N2 over N1. And you back up and just say that the turns ratio is the ratio of the number of turns on the primary divided by the number of turns on the secondary, or because it's a ratio, it can be just the inverse of that also. It, it's not so much dependent upon the actual number of turns, but rather the ratio. That means that if we had a N2 over N1 where we had a thousand turns on the secondary and uh, say a hundred turns on the primary, the turns ratio would be 10 to 1. So all of these calculations that we're going to be doing will depend only upon the turns ratio and not on the actual number of turns on each side. Thus it's possible to have a turns ratio that is not an integer. So in an ideal transformer, where we have I1, the current going into the primary, V1, the, current, the voltage that's driving the primary, V2, the voltage induced in the secondary, and I2, the current flowing from the secondary, we can then make these three um, relationships. The first one relates the voltage of the secondary to the voltage of the primary. The ratio of those two is directly equal to the turns ratio N2 over N1. What this is telling us is that the side, let's just assume that N2 had the larger number of turns, then V2 would also have the larger voltage. In other words, the largest voltage appears on the side that has the largest number of turns, and thus the voltage on the other side would be, on the side with a smaller number of turns, would be smaller than the voltage on the primary, on the side with the um, largest number of turns. I'm stumbling here just a little bit because it's important to realize that it won't always be that the primary has more turns than the secondary. What this is telling us again is that the side with the most turns has the greatest voltage. So if the primary, if N1 is larger than N2, then the primary voltage will be larger than the secondary voltage. And that transformer is said to be in a step-down configuration. When you go from a higher voltage to a lower voltage, the transformer is said to be stepping the voltage down. On the other hand, if the number of turns in the secondary, N2, was greater than the number of turns in the primary, then the secondary voltage would be greater than the primary voltage, and this transformer would be considered a step-up transformer. We'll see in an, in an example that we're going to be doing that you can use the transformer in either direction, depending upon whether you want to increase the voltage and thus decrease the current, or decrease the voltage and increase the current. That last statement comes from the fact that, we've, as we pointed out, P in equals P out, which means that V in I in equals, or I guess we're calling it V1 I1 is equal to V2 I2. Thus, if, voltage, if the voltage on the primary is larger than the voltage on the secondary, then the current in the primary is going to be smaller than the current in the secondary, so that the product of the two is the same. So, large voltage, small current, small voltage, large current. And that's what this second relationship is telling us. Here it was V2 over V1 equal to N2 over N1. 
Here it's the current in the primary over the current in the secondary is equal to the number of turns in the secondary N2 over N1. Again, what this is telling us is that if N2 has a larger number of turns than N1, then I1 is going to be smaller than I2. The larger current will exist in the winding that has the smaller number of turns. The smaller current will exist in the side with the larger number of turns in its winding. Finally, it's of interest to us to see what is the effect of the transformer on the way the load is perceived by the source. To put it another way, we have a source connected through a transformer to the load. Let's look at, let's look at the effect that this transformer has on the equivalent resistance that this source is driving. In other words, we're going to talk about the equivalent resistance here, call it REQ, which we're going to define as the ratio of V1 over I1. To facilitate the, that ratio, let's go ahead and solve this for uh, V1. Rearranging this, we get then that V1 is equal to V2 times N1 over N2. And similarly, let's rearrange this expression in, to give us I1. And we have I1 then is equal to I2 times N2 over N1. Now, we form the ratio V1 over I1 to give us the REQ. And we have then V1 over I1, again, that's equal to REQ, is then going to equal V2 times N1 over N2. That's just V1, divided by I1, which is I2 times N2 over N1. Now, we can clean this up a little bit by taking the ratio N2 over N1 in the denominator, inverting and multiplying it by the, that in the numerator, and we get then that this is V2 over V1 times N1 over N2 quantity squared. Now looking here at the secondary, we have this resistance R sub L. It has current I2 flowing through it with a voltage across it of V2, the voltage on the secondary. Thus, the ratio of V2 over I2 is going to equal R sub L. And we get then that R equivalent, the effective resistance seen by this source looking into the primary, is equal to the turns ratio N1 over N2 quantity squared times R sub L. Let's think about that for just a second. This is saying that the resistance that this source feels as a result of the coupling through the ideal transformer to the load here is going to not equal, it won't feel the R sub L, the resistance directly, it will rather feel the ratio of the turns quantity squared. Thus, transformers are used at times, particularly in communication systems, to balance the resistance or to change the resistance. If we don't like the size of the resistor for the source, the effect of that resistance can be modified using an, what's known as an impedance matching transformer.